Stick around with number three. Number two got jealous and told my wife on me. Now my wife, she got mad. Moved back home to her mother. Number two left town, number three. Done found us up a brand new lover, brother. I got a problem. And it's sure nobody get me down. Mr. Rush, it's an honor and privilege to really be sitting down, breaking bread with you here in Brooklyn. You have had a tremendous six months. Your album was nominated for a Grammy, and now this documentary, Take Me to the River. How do you feel right now? I feel like I'm in heaven already, man. Uh, this is the greatest time of my life. I'm working on a lot of things, but this particular thing here about that Take Me to the River, I'm so proud and so glad to be involved because it's a, it's a way of me reaching back to the younger guys who respect the older guy like myself, what we have done. It's like a torch, we're passing it to them. They can carry what we did, what we're doing, what we want to do in the future, carry it on in the future. Now, this, this documentary really is an amalgamation of the deep Delta blues musicians as well as the musicians that took hold of Memphis, Tennessee. Well, it's, when you talk about the deep blues uh, guy from Mississippi, Tennessee, even though they may be in New York, but if you check the background, a couple of generations back, you'll find all of them out of Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, Alabama, all Southern guys. Uh, we all cotton pickers, one way or the other. You know? And so when, when, you, when you talk about New York, California, when you talk about the East Coast, even when you talk about overseas, most of these guys migrated to, to this part of the country. Now, you collaborated with Memphis rapper by the name of Al Capone, <laughs> and and I want to know about Anna your Rachel, Anna <laughs> Rachel. That's right. Yeah. I want to know about really the connection of hip hop because it really is the stepchild of the blues and jazz and gospel. Well, let me tell you, the blues had a baby called it rock and roll. Out of rock and roll, then it came to soul music. Out of soul music, come the hip hop. Out of hip hop was the rap. So they're all connected, all from the same root, man. Uh, from the gospel and the blues, uh, everything was born out of it. So I'm one of the old roots of, of the, whatever the music about today, I'm one of the root of it. Speaking of roots, I want to talk about your album that was just nominated. You have an interesting duet with the legendary Dr. John. And we're talking about roots music. You guys pretty much quintessentially took it all the way back to Rootsville. Well, we took it back from what we uh, come from. I'm from Louisiana, home of Louisiana. He from New Orleans, the Roundup area. So we both relate to what we was doing so so cleverly and and so lucky and so blessed that we've been thinking about this for many, many years. So Carl Gustin came along and wrote a song called Another Murder New Orleans. And I wanted to do this because of the collaboration of the thing that we shouldn't turn our head and like a lot of people do. So that's not my child, that's not, not my mother, and it's not my business. But it is your mother. If it's an old lady, it's your mom, whether you're related to you or not. If it's not your child, it takes a village to raise all of them. So it's, it's our business. We must do something about it. We must stop turning our head and speak up and help the police or whoever it is to solve the problem and the things that need to be in. We got to do it. You know, I want to bring up some things that are very, very important to take me to the river in your career. One of the things that I think a lot of people are really going to be in awe of, this is the very last time we see awesome. the late Bobby Blue Bland in his prime. Bobby Blue Bland was my friend for 50 some odd years. I want people to come and see this movie, see this movement in, the, in this documentary because it's not only talking about the past, it's talking about the future because everything in this is talking about where we come from, where our granddaddies come from. We want people to see this. We want to take the music and the inner education of it back to the school. Hopefully that we can get it back into the school. Young people can take on what we started on to other places. In fact, you get the guys like Frazier and all the guys 
uh, Capone and all these guys, they can take it to places we've never been before. They're young, energized, and the days are a different time because that's some place that we couldn't go when I started 55 or 60 years ago. Now you can go places that I couldn't go. But it's all it's all it's almost uh, at a time where the black and white issue doesn't matter because the music doesn't separate us as, as a race. So we got to take it farther. And the music, we're gonna do it through the music. And that's what we're doing. Yeah. talk to you about some things uh, one of the things that has happened in your career is that you've had a dynamic of three things that have helped your musicianship you are an outright dynamic vocalist but you also play the harp and you also play the guitar and I understand that your father was very very important in helping you get the beginnings of this well my father being a preacher and of a pastor of a church I respect him so much of what he's done. He respects me as so much what I what I was, was getting ready to do as a child. Didn't know it was gonna come to this. But my father was a kind of person who never told me to sing the blues, but he never told me not to. So that was a green light because I came on with an area where there was a preacher, a gospel kind of a minded person, call it devil music. My daddy never called it devil music. My daddy let me have my own little wings and flew where I want to fly. 
I don't know whether it was good or bad, but I can tell you one thing. If it wasn't for that, maybe I wouldn't be singing the blues. And another guy that was very important in your life, and he influenced you, Ray Charles, James Brown, Quincy Jones, I could name endless, the great Louis Jordan. Oh God, that was my greatest writer. Louis Jordan always wrote about chicken, cows, horses, and, and things like that, animal, what uh, the grassroots cat could understand it as a, as a country boy. Well, then I, my first big record was Chicken Heads, and I always write about things like that, because Louis Jordan, I remember he wrote a song one time about a buzzard and a monkey. The buzzard and the monkey was a friend. So apparently the buzzard was his friend to the monkey that the monkey was a friend to the buzzard. So the buzzard convinced him to ride in the air with him. He got up in the air, he said to himself, said, now I got some art with this monkey. Here's a time that I'm gonna, I'm gonna harm him, I'll kill him. So he got up in the air and he did like this and the monkey put his t tail around his neck and it choked him. And the, the, and the monkey said, hey, so I got you now. The buzzer said, why are you choking me? He said, well, straighten up and fly right and cut out this zigzag design. So Louis Jordan wrote about, yeah, straighten up and fly right. So I always got my little thing from Louis Jordan. He was the best to me. Now, if you think about Muddy Waters, Howlin' Wolf, I like the Howlin' Wolf because his voice was so grizzly. I like the uh, Muddy Water because he dressed so well. I like the Little Walter because he was so swift with his harmonica. I like the Sonny Boy Wisdom as a hard player, but I like his vocalist thing. I like the Ray Charles because he played so well. I like the Jackie Wilson because he was so devil in what he was doing. And all of these things you can see in me. It's just like a bowl. You get a little bit of that, a little bit of this, a little from this guy, a little from that guy. You put him in a bowl, you stir him up, then you got a Bobby Rush. And you know, that's funny because, you know what's really funny? You have really took a lot of the rudiments of Lewis's band because he had the Tiffany Five and he sounded like a gigantic band and that's the sound that you brought to your blues ensemble. That's right. I, I brought that because it was two things. I liked it and that's what I understood and it was economically because when you got four or five guys sounding like 20 people then you could go into a club and, and present them with a price that they can afford because the chilling circuit is something we shouldn't all forget because we all come from that and I cut like that, record like that because they can afford me because one thing for sure, you shouldn't burn the bridge down that brought you across. Because from B.B. King on down to whoever you name, we all come from that way. They call it Chitlin Circuit. And we all come from that way. But sometimes we get so big in mind and heart, the big manager and record company put us in the place. We forget about them little guys with the two or three hundred, three, two or three hundred seaters. And none of one got us to where we are now. And I don't ever want to cross over and cross out. You know, I've seen you play an intimate guitar set and I've also seen you play with your 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 harmonica and it's weird because those are very very important elements not only of the church but also the blues <laughs> elaborate a little bit on how the harmonica really was the, really kind of one of the beginnings of the blues it was one of the first instruments even when David played the harp because it was the different it was a string harp and it was a finger harp and wind harp but it's all about the harp thing. And since you mentioned that, tonight I had planned to do something with the band that I'm not, I'm gonna change. Just talking to you now, I just changed my mind. Something I was gonna do with the band, uh, tonight I'm not gonna do it with the band now. Just because you said that. Just watch tonight, I'm gonna vary a little bit from what I had planned to do and do some thing with the harmonica. And show the kids to show the people that we don't need all this glamour stuff around us to be real. Because the most fun, most fun I ever had in my life was the two of us. <laughs> and you said something that's very, very important, the Chitlin Circuit and the Juke Joints. They didn't have room for a 20-piece band. It was either the piano, a bass, yeah, and a drum. drum. That was all. And, and most of the time, the bandstand was in, in the little corner, or in the window. It wasn't the big band thing. So now we all got all this 100,000-seater uh, 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 Renos and whole bit. All that's good. But, I, but the most fun I ever have is when I'm one-on-one. -on -one. Sitting in a little club, see six of people at a bar, you're playing by that time, just playing. Now you know the money is good when you get the bigger, with the bigger venue, you bring the bigger money. But the bigger thing for my soul is when I'm sitting with a hundred folks in the house. That soothes my soul. I saw 
I'm going to take you on home to Soulsville. Yeah. My family's from Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Wait a minute. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. My family is from my, on my mom's side. And it was oh, in... Oh, <laughs> no. You shouldn't do me like this. Now, this is... This oh, is <laughs> you shouldn't do this to me, man. Bobby, I understand. Oh, you shouldn't do me like this, man. I have to. Oh, boy. I'm... Technically, yes, because my grandmother 
and yeah, my grandmother and her family, they're from Wabasuki, and that's right down Highway 79. And um, Pine Bluff has a very, very important niche in your life because it was the first time you really decided to pursue blues full time. And let me tell you something. See, you, you're the only one that, see, Wabasuki and Wabasuki, Wabasuki just just a mile apart. Right. My first girlfriend in Wabasuki, not Wabasuki. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, man. Yeah. And I walked all the way from there to Artama to buy her a pop. I walked from Wabasig to Artama. Your feet were tired. Oh, yeah, but I was in love, man. <laughs> Boy. Yes. Oh, Every, man. It's, it's wild because that was, oh, you, you pursued the blues full time there. And also, you met a gentleman that was also a very important part of the blues, Elmore James. M.O. James worked with me at the at Pine Bluff at Jack Rabbits and at Jitty Bowl back in the early 50s. He was living at that time in, in a place called Canton, Mississippi. I got him to play for me for three days for $54, $54 a weekend. I paid him $50 a weekend. $4 for, $50 and $4 for transportation <laughs> for the weekend. Let me tell you how this happened. Now, this is a bad story. There was a guy in Chicago named Lee Robazine was engaged to a lady had Delta Blues, Delta uh, Delta Barrel Company, two funeral homes. He was engaged to this lady, and both of them equally my friend. So he came down, he was engaged. He said, Bobby Rush, I, I want you to come to my wedding. I said, I will. Lee Robazine is his name. And he said, oh, uh, when you, I said, when you going to get married? He said, I'll, I'll let you know. I said, okay. At the meantime, he and I got such a good friend, he would take me to the club when they didn't have a funeral. He wouldn't take me to the club because I wouldn't let him. I'd take me a block from the club. I would get out and walk to the club because I didn't want nobody to see me riding in this, this hearse. <laughs> he would take me to the hearse because he had a new hearse, you know. So he, so Elmo James was there one day. He was with, with a little place called Belzoni, Mississippi. I said, I got a gig in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, man, a, a, a jackrabbit. He said, well, how much you paying? I said, well, how much you want? He said, give me $20 a night, $60. I said, I can't pay $60. I only got $40 I can pay for the whole weekend. He said, I can't go for that. Can't go for that. I said, well, we were sitting there talking, and finally my friend, wife, or going to be wife, walked out. Good looking lady. He said, wow, look at that lady. He said, I do anything to, just to talk to her. I said, you will. I said, maybe I can fix that up. If you work this place, and go to Pine Bluff, Arkansas with me. He said, you fix it up. The long story short, I fixed it up for they could talk to each other, whatever they did while I was going. Every other week, Elmo Jam would go to Pine Bluff and play for me free because I hooked him up. <laughs> <laughs> so I got Elmo Jam to play for me free on 6th Street in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Yeah. You know, it's Jack Rabbit. Jack Rabbit. <laughs> You know what's really interesting about Elmer James is that he was really one of the pioneers of the slide, the slide. Well, let me tell you, let me give you a story about Elmo. That was a guy called Boyd Gimmo. Now, you're back and looking. Boyd Gimmo was Elmo James' first cousin, two brothers and sisters children. And Boyd Gimmo was a slide player who taught Elmo James. And he was playing with me and my band when I met Elmo James. So that's how I met Elmo James, through Boyd Gimmo. When you saw him play, uh, did, did you in a million years think that this man was going to really kind of put the fire in not only guitar but blues? I never thought that he would be this part into blues of my life, especially my life. Because at that time we were just guys playing around. He wasn't that popular. He was popular among us because we knew him. But you know, you follow me? <clears throat> but uh, we were just going up. We were just doing what we do. So when Elmo Jane told me one time, I said, Bobby Race. So you're going to make a lot of money one of these days. Well, I've been playing around, making $5 here and $5 there. And I couldn't uh, uh, perceive that I'm going to make a lot of money and doing something that I would do free. You know, because I was doing it for the love of it, not for the money of it. Elmo James told me that long, long years ago. You know, and, and when, you, when you're talking about the slide, he's the king of the slide. He was the king and still the king of it. When you heard Dust My Broom, <laughs> <laughs> I recorded that in 1960-something myself. Uh, he said he's going to get up in the morning and believe he dust my broom. Now, a lot of, a lot of people ask me, sir, what do you mean by dust your broom? I mean he's going to get up in the morning he's going to leave. I mean, he goes, whatever you have here, 
you have it. I, whatever I left here, I left it, and I'm just gone. All I want is look on the wall, get my old guitar for me. You know, that's all I want. You, you can, you, I got me in some place else to go. I know you got another man. Yeah, you know, if you're willing to let bygone be bygone, just walk away from it. Then it hurt her feeling about it. Just look on the other wall. Hang me down my walking cane. That mean a walking cane. I mean, give this little thing what he had on his back, whatever it was. He gonna leave. He walking away. When you left Pine Bluff, you you did what a lot of people of color did. They went on up to the big, big, big cities. And Man. Chicago was another another hotbed for you. It was another place that that I thought I could get display what I was inside of my soul and heart. I went, but I got was disappointed, but. But I overcome all the disappointment. The disappointment I came up to, I was going to leave the Southern State, go to Chicago, where uh, the work was better. You'd be treated better, I thought, in the whole bit. But I went there and got a job. Uh, I think it was before Freddie King would start to play with me. Uh, J.B. Illinois introduced me a guy in Robert, Illinois. Who's had a club? This friend of his had a club in Phoenix, Illinois. It was a white club. He got me a job. He said, "Now I can't work this job, but you can." I didn't understand what he was talking about. It was a club that we worked behind a curtain, day in and day out, but they never want to see your face. They want to listen to our music, but they didn't want to see our face. We play behind a curtain, and but uh, but he was kind of a racial kind of a person. He said, "Bobby Rush." You can do it, but I can't. I didn't understand it because I didn't know anything. I didn't know that much about black and white issues, but he did. He said, I can't, I can't wait behind a curtain. Well, well, come from where I come from, down in Shields, Arkansas, and Pine Bluff, Arkansas, we didn't know anything about anything but black folks. So my daddy was a farmer. Everybody was that black. When we went to school, if it was, all the teachers were black. So we didn't know nothing about it. We didn't have that. We didn't know about that. We didn't know about the racial thing because everybody was black at the church, everybody was black in the cotton field, everybody was black at, at school. So I didn't know anything about that, you know, but that racial thing. Then I came up in Illinois in the early 50s. I met a lady that I got married to in Key Wanda, Illinois. In this little town, there was about 30,000 people in this town, but there was only 18 to 20 black people in this town. So then our first child was born, I remember my wife after said, son, said, uh, you're going to the school, how many white kids in school with you? He said, three of us. He didn't know anything about no black and white issue. That's my son. And I was just almost the same way because I didn't have to work for no one. I didn't have to chop cotton, pick cotton for no one but my daddy. He would go out and contract the field, go all up in England, Arkansas, Car, you, you know what I'm name on play. That's right. And he would contract the whole field and pick them. But he would have black folks picking for him. My, I, didn't, I didn't have to pick for nobody else. Work for my dad. Bobby, explain to the viewers, there is a very, very unique difference between the Mississippi Delta Blues, Chicago Blues, and there's a little, the blues is a little different in Louisiana as well as Kansas City. There's, the blues is the same, but it's a little different in the different regions. It's the story is the same, it's just the approach is different. When you got in Chicago, the same guy was in Jackson, Mississippi. It's the same guy who mortified himself when he got to New York. He tried to speak a little better, he tried to talk a little better, tried to know a little more about what he was doing. Because when he left Mississippi, he said, I'm going to New York. But when he got here, it was New York. <laughs> you understand? That, that, that ain't much different, but just the approach of it. Because he wanted someone, or she wanted someone to think that they were educated enough to handle themselves in a lot of situations. But the main thing about the blues, if you're a blues singer, and some people don't want to be called blues singer because there's something less than something else. But writers, reporters, radio station, TV station, all blame for this. I, I, I blame them for that because they want to talk about the blues being something less than something else until the white guys started doing it. Then it was all right to do. Now you got a few of the guys who's still around who don't want to be known as blues singer because they don't want to, it's, it's too, maybe it's too black for them or too whatever. But one thing for sure, everybody knows Bobby Rush. 
What you see is what you get. I'm proud of who I am or what I do. I'm proud of my dad. I'm proud of my mom. I'm proud of the root. Proud of where I come from. That don't make me less than something else because I didn't have a chance to do what they are doing. Because I'm, I'm God child. And I just do what you see is what you get. Thank you.